This is the award-winning Lee Pitts Live. Brought to you by the North Law Firm for car accidents and negligent security cases. Call Joe at 239-337-1191. And by Lee Health. Welcome to another edition of Lee Pitts Live. I'm Esmond Lewis, and I have the distinct honor of interviewing the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Lee Pitts. Lee, uh, first of all, it's an honor to be uh, a part of your show, and uh, welcome to the start of your 28th anniversary on air. So I know you, you're usually on this side <laughs> of the uh, interviewing table, so how does it feel to be on that side? Very weird, man. I mean, just the viewpoint, the, the way I'm angled towards you, uh, where the cameras are is all like a parallel universe. I'm in an alternate uh, universe. And I'm actually wearing a bow tie to celebrate uh, 28 year turning 28. And, uh, and it's such an honor to have a guy like yourself who's a renowned attorney in the area to uh, come in and spend some of those attorney hours uh, interviewing me. So thanks a lot, man. Thank you. It's indeed my pleasure. Um, what I'd like to do today is just go back through your life. And I know most people uh, know you from uh, being a television host of the longest running show in Southwest Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they know all of the history that you have made. Um, but not everyone knows your life story. Right. And of course, um, the interesting thing about my life story. I mean, I never even thought I'd be talking about my life story one day. I just was going through life. And um, but what happened is uh, in the early 1990s, maybe 1995, I started uh, talking on a lot of college and high school campuses. People would call me to come in and talk to the students. And I would speak at assemblies and different things. And I still do that now. But uh, and I would talk about things that I was doing. They would introduce me as the vice president at you know, First Union Bank or uh, in, uh, you know, Hall of Fame swim instructor and uh, TV talk show host and all this. So the students would be into that. But what was so interesting is when we got into the question and answer section, I, after I spoke, I never talked about who I, where I came from. I just talked about what I was doing. When we got in the question and answer session with the students, that would be the first thing out of their mouth. Where did you come from? How did you get there? How did you overcome those obstacles? Then I started sharing where I came from, and I found out that that was more interesting to them than it was, you know, I'm a vice president at a bank, I'm a television talk show host, and I've been able to do some things in swimming at a high level. So now I'm more comfortable talking about it because I used to didn't even like to talk about it. But I grew up in the housing projects in Birmingham, Alabama, college via housing projects. And um, my mom raised seven kids. And I was the next to the youngest. And, uh, and I was the youngest boy. And my whole childhood, to me, when I look back at it, was so much fun. Even though we didn't have much. Even though my mom didn't finish high school and my dad didn't finish high school. And they were separated as long as I can remember. We still had fun around there and there was a whole lot of emphasis on work ethic, academics, and church. We went to church so much. <laughs> you know, as a little boy, you know, you're like, hey, I'm tired of going to church. But it is the thing though, uh, I, uh, all that was good for my foundation and it carries me to this day. And uh, so I, I essentially out of whole cloth, I rose from uh, poverty uh, and uh, was uh, doing well, did well in school, stayed away from drugs, alcohol, any of that stuff. To this day, I've never uh, tr done any illegal drugs and never had any alcohol in my body. I, I, you know, That's impressive. Just, uh, you know, people find that to be quite interesting, but it was just the way I was raised, and, and I just kind of kept that habit and took it forward. I wish I could do that with sugar. But um, uh, so in high school, right. uh, I was a... Uh, president of student government, and all along that way, I played a lot of sports, you know, swimmer, basketball, played football, I was a boxer, 
uh, ping pong, tennis, all those things I think really shaped me and kept me out of trouble because I was always active. Right. Uh, in addition to mm -hmm. your, your sports, you're also on the student government in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what that was like. Well, <laughs> that was uh, transformative because in high school, I wasn't interested in all of that. Uh, being in the spotlight, even though I'm in the spotlight now, I wasn't trying to be in the spotlight in high school. I wanted to get along with the crowd. But uh, my buddies, I had a couple of buddies. I'm calling you out on TV, Ralph DeBart Laban and Johnny DeBart Laban, my two buddies in high school at Carver High School in Birmingham. They said, hey, you should run for president of student government. I'm like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you should run for president of student government. I need somebody from the projects to, to, to be the president of student government. Anyway, long story short, I eventually ran and, you know, I won by a landslide. Uh, so surprisingly to me that students, uh, I think I got like 98% of the vote. Nine, wow. Yeah, 98% of some crazy uh, number. I guess those other candidates voted for themselves and that knocked it down to 98. But there I was, president of the student government and all of the responsibilities pertaining there too of uh, leadership. Before I close that part, I want to say that. That job as president of the student government, it follows me to this day. Some of the things I had to do then as a president. One, I had to be a leader. Two, the freshmen were watching me. I remember when I come in the bathroom, if I saw freshmen, they were in there and they were smoking cigarettes or what have we, they would start putting their cigarettes out or what have we in the bathroom. And I always feel funny about that. Like, hey, I'm just a student like you. You don't need to put your cigarettes out for me. This ain't no real, I'm not no real nothing. But they just kind of out of respect, you know, hey, right. he's the president and he's conducting himself a certain way. And, and that's just the way it was. And uh, when I came in the cafeteria, I know this is minor, but to me, it was a big deal. So coming to cafeteria, you know, in the cafeteria, we skip the lunch line. People do it all the time. Right. This is in the hood. I went to all black high school. People skip the line. Your friends call you up. You just skip the line. So we go to the cafeteria to eat and came in with my two buddies and it's when our friends were up there to come on up, we're going up to skip the line. I was walking with them. And while I was walking up that line to skip the line, I could hear the other students mumbling, look at him, president of the student body and skipping line. So then, then when I got up there in line, I could still hear him mumbling. So I tapped my buddies. I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to the back of the line. They didn't really understand because now right. it's a whole different, I'm a different lead. I can't do what you guys do. And good, the good thing about this is those two buddies that were with me, they went and got in the back of the line with me. They said, okay, we understand that you can't do this anymore. I said, yeah. I, I, I. And, and that's been the story of my life since then, even here with this television show, even with other things. I just can't. I'm always conscious of trying to make sure I, uh, you know, put forth the, you know, the best image I could possibly put forth. Well, they say with uh, great blessings come great responsibilities. And I'd imagine that that is, is one of many examples that shows um, the type of responsibility that you have to have with the gifts that you've been blessed with. Right. But it's hard for me to even phantom putting myself up on some kind of, you know, statue. Still hard to talk about it in a way that I don't seem like I'm thinking I'm all of that, you know, as you well know, over the years, I've gotten a tremendous amount of awards, uh, a lot of praise for a lot of things that I've done, and mostly is related to swimming in a television show. Television show is really kind of taken over now from the swimming thing. I worked hard to actually get rid of being known as the swimming teacher at the Stars Complex and the success we had over there with all the kids and my volunteer work. But as I was working to get rid of the swimming image, I don't want people to start thinking about the TV show, you know, we want to brand the TV show. I found out that that's, that, that impact that with those children and that would never leave. It's, it's, and it's good to have something that people know you for. Sure. And um, the, the responsibility of the television show kicked in day one when I first started the TV show. People might not know, you know, back in like 1992, there was no such thing as a television show in Southwest Florida had ever existed with a black person hosting it. Certainly. And certainly seeing all these black people on TV every Sunday, all on social media, talking about non-violent type things, talking about intellectual things, talking about the total person, law, education, 
athletics, just a wide range of topics, not in handcuffs. And uh, I think that that brought about a whole lot more responsibility, but it also started in the early stages of high school, so it wasn't that uh, a big burden on me to actually do it. Sure. One point I'll make, though, and people might find this interesting, is that when the show first started around 1992, Big articles came out in the local newspapers saying that the show wouldn't last one year. They say it'll be off the air because Lee Pitts has no television experience. He's never hosted a TV show. Uh, he's a banker. He's a swimming instructor. And he would not be able to get enough interesting guests to sustain the show. So they predicted it'd be off the air in one year. Right. Here we are now. 28 <laughs> years later. <laughs> so what does that say? It says, uh, well, you often talk about at the end of your shows, yes. you have a quote about uh, people who talk about getting it done are usually being interrupted by people who are actually getting it done. You're, you're uh, so right. That, it, it fits right in there. Go ahead. You know, if there's anything that that, that statement shows, it, it shows a certain amount of determination, drive, hustle, to, so to speak. Um, I'd like to go back to your days of swimming okay. and, and take us from your earliest days in swimming to how it got you to be a, uh, a nationally awarded swim instructor and somebody who released uh, a, nationally, uh, a nationally renowned uh, swimming instruction uh, tape. DVD, yeah. DVD. Man, that's why you're going to take over my job. So I see, that kind of question like that, that's Emmy Award winning stuff. Okay, right. don't take my job over, man. <laughs> but uh, that, that's a great question. Now, uh, swimming actually is the foundation for everything that has happened to me in life that I think has been progressive for me and has benefited me. I started uh, swimming, luckily, at around six years old. Uh, the primary way that I financed my swimming lessons, because my mom couldn't afford it, uh, the way I primi uh, primary way I financed my ability to get into the swimming pool was I had to go out and hustle soda bottles. It was 50 cents to get in the pool, and uh, my mom said, hey, I don't have 50 cents for you to go down, get down in that little nasty pool, you know, that, you know, that was just her, the way she looked at it, like, that's a waste of money, 50 cents. And she did tell me, though, if I could figure out a way to pay for my own swim lessons, you can go. Got it. So I started walking around the neighborhood looking for deposit bottles on the ground every day. I needed 10 bottles to get my 50 cents. I got five cents per bottle. I went down there to a Fano's grocery store, uh, Huntsville Road in Collegeville, turned in my bottles, got my 50 cent, went swimming. Swam every day, every day. It was hard getting those bottles, by the way. People weren't throwing away deposit bottles back in the 70s and early, late 60s. But uh, so I walked up and down railroad tracks. I walked and looked up under the hedges. I looked in the dumpsters and all these things. People, yes, a six and seven year old kid could walk around in the neighborhood back then and nobody would try to molest them or grab them. We had a whole free range of the hood to walk around and it was just a different time then. So even so, though we're, we're not, we're talking about projects mm -hmm. in, in Birmingham, Alabama, it may not be the type of violent atmosphere that you might see in some other uh, urban projects. Yeah, it was totally different, man, back in the early 70s, late 60s. Uh, everybody knew everybody. The lady up the street knew I was Miss Johnny Bell, little boy. My mom was the sanctified mom down the street, and we go to church all the time, and he walks around looking for bottles, and the man on the corner, everybody know everybody. So you just had like a village looking out for you. When I look back at it, all that freedom I had to find those bottles. But those bottles gave me work ethic every day. Kids would laugh at me looking for bottles to go swimming. And I would still look for those bottles and I would get in that pool and I would train myself. And I first started training myself. Then this swimming instructor discovered me and then he put me in some formal classes that were free, put on by the Boys and Girls Club of America. And uh, then I got formal training, you know, six years old. And I started swimming competitively and became one of the top swimmers in the neighborhood and eventually became a lifeguard, a swim instructor, head swim team coach. And all those things happened before I actually went to college. So people might think uh, he just popped up teaching as a swim instructor, but a lot happened at, uh, then. Then after I finished college and, and got deep in my professional life, 
the technology of a DVD had come into existence. I had coached a lot of swim teams, taught a lot of swim lessons. So I decided to put together a Learn to Swim DVD that became one of the best selling uh, instructional swim uh, apparatuses in, in, in the history of America. And it was and still is the only swim lesson DVD with a black swimming instructor and culturally diverse children swimming and demonstrating in the video. All races, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and whites. It was very important to me to show that diversity as we move the uh, thought process around blacks and swimming forward. I've seen uh, portions of that DVD, and I, I give you credit, Lee, uh, outstanding job. Thank you. Um, I know this is something that you probably don't talk very much about, but uh, with the listeners thinking about the fact that you grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, <laughs> child of the 60s, mm -hmm. um, knowing historically civil rights movement, what was happening during that time, what was it like to be uh, uh, growing up in the 60s with people like Bull Connor, George Wallace on the scene? Cool. Okay. First, I want the viewers to know that I have no idea what questions Esmond is going to ask me. This is not prefabricated. This is Esmond's questions. He's an attorney. He does his thing. He does a great job. Thank you. So, so check this out, Esmond. So in uh, 1963, when that, look, the church was bombed in, in Birmingham, we lived like a block away from the church. My mom tells me about wow. that. Uh, the 16th Street Baptist Church. We lived about a block away. My mom says she kind of grabbed all her kids when she heard that, like, like an earthquake in the neighborhood. Okay, so I'm three years old. So when a lot of this was going on, I was such a little kid. I didn't really know. Looking back at history, I'm realizing, hey, I was there during that time. So by the time my generation got to go to uh, high school and things of that nature, schools were integrating and so on. In our neighborhood, they hadn't integrated. So I went to an all-black elementary school, all-black high school. There was no middle school back then. But here's what I do know. I do know that we were in deeply segregated areas, and I do know that when I used to see my father talking to white people, he would have his head down. I do know that my mom did domestic work, and I do know that when we went on field trips, the teachers in the school would take us on field trips from time to time to see the old segregated Alabama. And we would see those white only fountains still there. We see the signs still there. Right. And we were so little, you know, nine, 10 years old, 11 years old. We didn't even understand the significance of that. But I actually saw it in person. That was your reality at right. that time. When Dr. King was killed, uh, I was in class. Teacher came in crying. I was in the third grade. Dr. King is dead. All these people were crying. For weeks, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, for weeks the teachers would be playing Dr. King albums in the class. Dr. King would be saying all of these big words. I didn't understand anything that he was talking about. And I was really too tired of hearing these Martin Luther King albums. Got older, started listening to Dr. King's speeches. Then I understood what he was talking about when I was a little boy. So those teachers knew that we needed to hear Dr. King's message in order for us to understand where we are in this society and how we are to move forward. To a degree, you are uh, an example of Dr. King's dream. Tell us what was your mother's dream and your father's dream for you and uh, how that has brought you to be the man that you are today. Okay, let me make sure I put a nice little bow on my dad. My dad is still alive, my mom is still alive. My dad is still in my life, he was in our life when we were children, but my mom and dad were not together. So we see him from time to time, he was not doing the heavy lift in the day to day of raising us. Got it. Now that I'm older, I understand the importance of what a father has to do. You got to be there. You got to be raising your kids. You got to be there when they wake up in the morning, pick them up from school, take them to sports. My dad never saw me swim, play sports or any of those kind of things. He didn't come to my graduation in high school or my college graduations, any of that stuff. So that's the way it is. And I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on my dad, who is named Lee Pitts. So now he has this name that's popular. He, people tell him all the time, you know, just, you related to the Lee Pitts. He's like, yeah, that's my son. Oh, wow. My dad is cooled in that way. Now, so, but my dad was a high value guy, truck driver, uh, did his time in, in the uh, Korean War, and uh, just regimented. My mom, on the other hand, was a homemaker slash domestic worker, 
clean houses for the white folk. And uh, then she eventually graduated up to having it. Uh, she was a, 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 a caretaker, like a, a home sitter for sick people. And, and she did really well in that. And she was a, always an entrepreneur, sold out. Uh, Avon, Mary Kay, she would make artwork, plaster, parrots, type work and paint it, sell it to all the people in the neighborhood. They had all my mom's art in their house in the hood. And my mom always knew how to make a dollar. And that's what I like about her because I got that from her. How to have all these things going on at one time. And then she made sure that we, we were in the church. I want bow tie this. So with me having three things going on at one time, you know, bank vice president, television talk show host, swim instructor. That was not anything unusual to me. People would always ask me, how do you do all three of those things? How do you do all three of those things? I didn't ever thought about it because my mom and all of our, all our children, we were enterprising, always figuring out how to put a, you know, a nickel together and a nickel together and make something. And I, I know I got that from watching her. And uh, the funny thing is, even my mom, nobody at home ever asked me, about how do I do all three of those things. It never came up. I used to wonder, why did the other people ask me how do I do three things when nobody at home ever asked me that? It's because at home, we all were figuring out a way to put two nickels, rub two nickels together, you know, bootleg, doing somebody hair, bootleg, washing somebody car, just make a dollar, man. Sell, get some clothes from Salvation Army, mark the price up, sell them out the back door. Okay. My mom was selling ice cream cones out the back door, cookies, candy, fish sandwiches on Friday. I mean, it just the way it was. And it was just a beautiful thing to see. <laughs> I love that story. Um, I'd like to discuss a little bit more about Lee Pitts, the teenager, the high school student. And I'd like to do that when we come back from this next break. So we'll be back on Lee Pitts Live. Welcome back to the 28th anniversary celebration of Lee Pitts Live. And I am your host, Esmond Lewis, and I'm interviewing the interviewer on today. Lee, when we last left off, we, we spoke a little about your childhood. I'd like to focus in a little bit on your days in high school. Now, how does a young man who comes from A.G. Gaston Boys and Girls Club, Collegeville Projects, um, in Birmingham, Alabama, become the student government president of your high school? <laughs> Not by design, that's for sure. But uh, I think, though, looking back and all my, and, not, and just trying to, like, be more transparent, um, I was destined to be the president of student government. Now, I've never said that out loud until now. Right. But sometimes you have to have that internal confidence. But I wasn't had no aspirations to be out front or be the leader, but I'm saying I was destined to do that based on some things that had happened leading up to that point. Tell me. You know, one, one, because I grew up fast, okay? Let me tell you how fast I grew up. I was mature beyond my years at an early age. So at uh, five years old, when my mom, all my siblings had gone off to school and my mom was managing her money and she couldn't afford babysitter and all that, and she was trying to make ends meet. She came to me at five years old and said, hey, you're gonna have to keep your sister. So when everybody went off to school, my older siblings, I had a sister who was three years younger than me. So at five years old, I was at home watching soap boppers and all of that, five. At five. Keeping my sister who was two. Wow. Yeah, changing diapers, whatever it was, preparing her lunch, everything. Just Staying in the house, following what my mom told us to do, and then when my siblings got home from school, they took over, the older siblings. So I didn't really have anybody keeping me at five. I was not only keeping myself, I was keeping my sister. At five, five years right. old. So by the time I got to the first grade, going to school, I was so advanced in terms of maturity, listening to the teacher, doing what I was supposed to do, coming home, doing my chores, just kind of, then even in elementary school, my friends knew that I had set my directions on. Look, I'm not gonna do any cigarettes. I'm not gonna smoke any marijuana. I'm not gonna do any alcohol. So they got used to that. You know, when everybody was sneaking around doing what they were doing, I had my little rules. 
they had to deal with it. You didn't like it. You didn't have to be my friend. So, and then I had friends who was cool with me. They didn't do that. We went on through. So those type of leadership skills, those kind of, uh, this is who I am. Other students saw that. Hey, he just who he is. He's not trying to cause any harm to anybody else. He gets along with everybody. He's friendly. He's, he, he doesn't wear the fanciest clothes. He doesn't come from this great background, but he's a regular guy. Right. So when it was time for them to vote for president of student government and I was on the ballot, when they look at the ballot, they don't look at him as some fake guy all of a sudden want my vote because he didn't even speak to me the whole through elementary school, high school. He didn't even look out of the way. Now he wants my vote. They just look at, hey, he was just a regular guy along with us playing sport, doing everything else. And, and uh, we know that he's good uh, in his book. We know he's considered a smart kid. Right. I mean, back then, you don't want to be considered the smart kid, but you know, I was considered one of the smart boys. And I think all of that played into, especially when you go to an all-black school and you're looking for somebody to vote for you, and black folk don't play when it comes to voting. If you've been a snob and you haven't been uh, personable, if you've just been phony, they and a let, fake. They're going to let you know. They're going to let you know. Right. Even if you're running for queen, you're black in a black school, black college, whatever, you're running for queen, and you've been a snob, and you've been all stuck up, and now that you're running, you want us to vote, that's when they're going to get you. Black people will get you at that moment when you need them to support you. If you haven't been right by them, they will let you know and vote no. So <laughs> I got 98% of the vote, and... Uh, Carver High School, hey, thank y'all for uh, having that confidence in me, and, uh, and uh, that helped me a lot to be doing what I'm doing now. And, and uh, then my high school, a couple of years ago, inducted me into the High School Hall of Fame, which was a big to-do. I was so glad in that manner that I went into the High School Hall of Fame, not for sports. Lee, I am sure that with a student government president, a black young man who is excelling in school, sports, played tennis, you played basketball, swimming, doing all of those at a high level. The colleges were <laughs> flocking to uh, get you to attend their institutions. No. <laughs> uh, the, and that was a good thing, that they weren't flocking to me to attend their institutions and in sports. Now, I would have liked to, yeah, been highs recruited in everything. I got some recruiting in, as a swimmer. But by the time I got in high school and started playing other sports, swimming started to fade to the background. It's because it wasn't popular. There were no cheerleaders for swimmers. It just wasn't, uh, it just, it, it, it kind of took a backseat. But the main thing people need to understand, looking at me now, I'm like six foot one inch tall. When I came out of high school, I was probably about 135 pounds and I was about five feet, 10 inches tall. So I was a little slight, uh, physically fit little guy and considered really small. So you know how these coaches and scouts look at you as though, you know, you got to be all these dimensions to be a, a great athlete. You weren't that prototypical no, athlete. No, no. Uh, I was a boxer and I was just cardio and just fit, like kind of like Bruce Lee. Got it. And now uh, tough. Glad you heard me say, and I'm glad they didn't come calling. When I spoke at my high school induction a couple of years ago into my high school hall of fame, uh, it was a nice crowd there, and everybody was happy, you know, from the neighborhood. Felt like I had gone off and done well with my life and, and brought some positive to my neighborhood, which I'm so proud of, uh, the College Bill Housing Projects and Carver High School, Hudson, uh, Talladega College, Atlanta University. I want to make sure I get them all in because sometimes I forget to mention them. But they'll let you know when they're watching this right now. Right. Uh, when I spoke at my uh, Hall of Fame induction for Carver High School, one of the things I made clear that I was happy that I didn't get routed into the world of sports. Sure, people do well in sports. And some people go on and, and accomplish a lot of things in sports, but it's the probability is a lot less that you're gonna make it to professional levels right. and get paid money. I got started getting paid money early in swimming. From the time I became a lifeguard, I was making money off my swimming skills. And then as a swimming instructor, and then as a pool manager, and just as a summer job, I was just making money. Yeah. If I had put all of my energies towards sports, I wouldn't be where I am today. 
So my energies got routed towards the books. That's a lesson for the children. So I'm glad that I didn't go to college and play sports. I'm glad that I didn't have to make a decision whether I focus on my books or focus on sports. I'm glad it was just one thing, books. Develop the brain, your probabilities of having long-term success in anything you go into. You develop what I call transferable skills. For example, once you learn you know, solid math, solid English, very well at, at writing, uh, reading, geography, worldview, news, comprehend, uh, math, all these kind of things, they are transferable to all types of uh, occupation. Case in point, you an attorney, all that reading that you did, all of that analyzing that you do, made this job, even sitting here interviewing me, easy. You did your research, you got your questions, transferable skills, you speak correct English, you uh, write well, you can go into being a professor at a university, you could be a school teacher, you could be the head of the police department. All those skills that you have are transferable that you can quickly go into other fields. Right. When sports, you got this. You play football, after, you, after that, if you don't play football, it's not really transferable. You maybe be a coach or whatever, but you can't be to the highest level. You could be to the highest level. You could be the president of the United States because your skills are transferable to that job. Right. You. That's why we see a lot of lawyers in general, particularly coming out of the O.J. Simpson trial. Sure. A lot of those black lawyers became television, news people, talk show hosts. I knew them all. I was watching them. They were in the O.J. Simpson trial being analysts. You see them all on CNN it's now. A natural transition <laughs> to that. Transferable skill. Right. Broad range education. All that history you studied. I say all this stuff because I should have been a lawyer. I should have made something out of myself. <laughs> I think you did pretty good. You think you did pretty good. Oh, okay, okay, but I, I say that all the time. And I, I say that in all sincerity, though. I, I, you know, I should have made something out of myself. <laughs> now, you attended an HBCU. At Talladega College. Talladega College. Undergrad and grad school. Okay. I'm a product of a black, full black education for whatever that means to people. I went to all black elementary school, went to all black high school, went to all black undergrad at Talladega College, went to all black graduate school at Atlanta University. Do that with that what you may. Wow, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. And now after all of this education in historically black college and all black high school, middle school, elementary school, how did you land in Southwest Florida? Okay. Um, so I come out of grad school, I, I, I'm, in, I'm, work, I'm MBA, I'm getting my master's in finance, and I get interviewed by all these uh, corporations on campus in Atlanta. All these banks. I had decided early on I was going to be a banker. I did well in a money and banking course at Talladega College, like my junior year, and the Professor Jones told me, you know, Lee, you, you could consider a career in banking. So he said I could consider a career in banking. I, I stuck to that, and I uh, said I was going to be a banker. I didn't know what all that meant. So anyway, all these recruiters started coming on campus when I was in grad school. They wanted to interview uh, students, all these banks. So I started going to the placement office. I'm interviewing. And the interesting thing about me is my concentration was in finance. No, my concentration was in economics. All the other people who were coming there, their concentration was in finance and marketing, information systems. But they always wanted to talk to the econ guy. I was the econ guy because they knew econ was very difficult and people didn't want to do economics. I was in an economics major uh, concentration. So I got all these interviews, got all these job offers. So I, uh, this is going to be the first time I get out of being below the poverty line in terms of money. Get my first job offer, $35,000 oh, a year, wow. you know, back in like 1985. That's big uh, money. Oh, I got a letter in the mail saying, you know, congratulations. This is with the National Bank of Detroit. $35,000. So, I, you know, I take a job in Detroit. I work up there for a few years. Then um, I get called by, you know, Headhunter, who was interested in me coming to Florida to work for First Union. First Union had offered me a job coming out of grad school. I didn't take it. They kept my resume, kept tracking me. Now I had three years experience. And they brought me down to Jacksonville. And I worked for First Union in Jacksonville. I got a promotion that brought me to Fort Myers to be the uh, vice president and regional director for 
uh, the Southwest Florida area for the bank. And that's how I ended up in uh, Southwest Florida. And uh, never in my wildest dreams that one, I think I'd be here this long. And two, that I think that I would become a recognizable name or anything. I was just here doing my banking job. Interesting thing, though, I have to give Willie Battle credit for this, who's a former NAACP president. He came up to the bank uh, and talked to me and said, I need to get out of the bank and get into the community. I was just picking up a check. He knew that was, I was the first black person in the area who was a vice president of the bank. But I was just going to work and coming home, going to work. And, you know, I didn't understand anything about community involvement. Right. That takes uh, everybody thinks that that's just everybody knows that you just you just don't think about the civil rights or anything. It's just and he told me I needed to get into the community. So one of the first things I did was uh, I started teaching swimming, got me into the community. And that's how all of that came about. So next thing I know, I'm in Southwest Florida and and a lot of great things happened because I thought it was a slow place. Why am I here? What I got to get out of this place. I got to get to Atlanta. <laughs> it was meant to be. All right. Now, um, you know, you've talked about the fact that you became a vice president in the bank. Uh, that's I, I'm sure that I was 29. Yeah. History making. Yes. Especially for a young black man at that time. How does a young man now parlay his uh, his abilities as a banker to starting a swimming program at the Stars Complex? OK. Transferable skills come back into play. Now, me, I wasn't a guy who just walked off the tulip truck and swimming. I was a high-level swimming instructor before I was uh, a banker. I mean, I had the certification at the highest level, scuba diving certification, water safety instructor, instructor training. Uh, I was training uh, swimming instructors to be swimming. All this other young age, I was a prodigy in that. I was a prodigy. So then I stopped. I went to college, worked in the pools in the summer jobs, and I worked at the college pool. Then I went to grad school, summer job, working at the pools, managing pools. So I was all engulfed with that chlorine. In fact, man, I was so happy that I actually had a job that I didn't have to be in chlorine and have on swimming trunks and in the sun. I was so happy to have a job with a tie on. I used to just say, I can't wait to have a job with a tie on. I was so happy to give away <laughs> from swimming. I was like, oh, geez, no more swimming. Unbeknownst to me. That was the main place I needed to be, was in the swimming pool. So interesting point is um, when I um, decided to volunteer at the Stars Complex in Fort Myers and create the Lee Pitt Swim School, the whole genesis behind that swim school was none of these children will have to pay to go swimming. They won't have to do what I had to do, hustle soda balls and find their way. We would bring them in, we would teach them formal swim lessons, and they would go on from there. So we eventually you know, had a successful swimming team, won the district championships here, the only black swimming team to ever win a district championship here in Southwest Florida, went up to Naples and won the districts. And um, uh, the Quality Life Center partnered with me, we called them the Quality Life Center SEAL. Had about uh, 250 kids in the program and it's still being talked about today. And right. people still say, well, why aren't you doing that now? One, I have other stuff to do. I trained a lot of people to keep it going. It didn't become what it became. And uh, I'm old. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you are not old. <laughs> you know, as a, as a swimming instructor in the area, I'd imagine that you had a lot of contact with kids. I know you have mm -hmm. a son of your own. Oh, yes. How does, uh, what type of life lessons would you tell the younger Lee Pitts based on the man that you are now? Right. And I'd imagine that you'd tell those lessons to your son. Yes. Well, I'm starting to tell him stuff. He's turning nine now. In fact, um, did you mention that the other day he was you know, looking at me on YouTube. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I had been like, well, wait until he's old enough to, so I went to his school uh, last year where they brought, the, it was called Daddies and Donuts. Right. And I'm really active in my son. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a real daddy. <laughs> okay. So uh, Daddies and Donuts, the son takes me to school. And um, I'm sitting in there and all the other daddies are sitting in there. And we have to write on paper what we do. So I'm sitting there in my sweatsuit or whatever. People don't know who me from Jack. So I write TV talk show host, the swimming instructor, bank vice president, all that. 
My son knows that's what I am. So then the teacher goes up to the front and she got all these daddy's cards. And the, the, the part of the thing is that the kids are supposed to identify whose dad is that when they read it off the card. Right. So when they did all that and nobody could identify that was Brandon Pitt, Brandon Lee Pitt's daddy. So uh, he was over there smiling, you know, and uh, and then eventually that Brandon dad, that's who he is. And they showed a clip of me on TV. And all of a sudden, my son is famous. His name, you know, he showed a clip of me on the, on the smart board there on TV. And all the kids find out that my little boy's dad is on television. And he probably thought it was whole harm. He sees me around the house reviewing shows and editing shows right. and doing things. But he didn't pay much attention. Leap his lie, just keep moving. Then all those kids start saying, hey, man, your dad is on TV. You know, you. And then now he's kind of, you know, sticks his chest out. And uh, I told him now I'm going to start going back and showing him all these magazine articles and news articles and everything. So you have an understanding of, you know, some of the work that his old, he thinks I'm old, uh, daddy did. Because even to this day, right? I, you know, took me a while to get him to think that I could teach swimming. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I had to put him in a swim class with somebody else to teach it. It just, you just daddy, you don't know nothing. Right. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, then once he got him rolling, then I took him and now I'm teaching him real advanced stuff because now he realizes all that stuff I tried to teach him at first when he wouldn't pay attention. When I put him in the class with the other kids and the other instructors, he saw that, hey, that's the same thing daddy was trying to teach me. Now he's back to daddy. He looks at my DVD. He thinks wow. I'm somebody. And so so what I would what I tell him now is I want him to like be exposed to a lot of things uh, so that when he grows up, nothing would be a surprise to him. He doesn't have to be a swimmer. He doesn't, you know, he can know swimming. He doesn't have to do that for a career. He can, he can, he can know math. He can know science. He can know travel, uh, technology. So, and uh, have him now in some real advanced math uh, tutoring programs that he goes to after school. So I want him to just have a real strong math base though. Got it. That's not, you know, uh, I'm saying that kind of like, well, let me edit this for a minute. I didn't have anybody giving me all of that, what I needed to be. So I was able to just write my own ticket on however I wanted to do my life. My parents weren't given, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to go to school, you got to go to college. That wasn't being talked about. So I try not to make sure I'm trying to tell, to, to craft out his life for him. But I do want to kind of put some things in place, you know, where he can have a chance, you know. And then when he gets out of the house, he can do whatever he wants to do. Got it. <laughs> now, to uh, put a bow tie on this interview. Okay. And I thank you for this opportunity again. Cool. Um, you've been uh, the longest running show uh, in Southwest Florida, history making show. Mm -hmm. You've done so many other things where you have uh, made history. Your name is, uh, is on a building at Hodges University. Mm -hmm. Um, you've been doing this. The Lee Pitt uh, Student Union. The U Lee Pitt Student Union. Yeah. You have been doing this for 28 years and have been basically a man of the people for all of the time that, uh, most of the time that you've been here in this area. What sort of satisfaction does it bring to you to have interviewed so many people in this area, so many different disciplines, so many different things, and, and have been an integral part of this community? What sort of satisfaction does that bring Lee Pitts? Well, it's, uh, it's like I haven't really sat back and done, thought about it in that way, but I will come back to that. But I want to make sure before we close this out that uh, once I got married to my beautiful wife, Michelle, who is from Grenada. I'm also from Grenada. So. Who does such a fantastic job and allowing me to do what I do because she sees me, I'm, I'm gone on Saturday nights, a lot of times covering banquets and trying sure. to help uh, let the show do its job, which is to be in the community. And she does a great job with my son, Brandon. And so thank you, Michelle, love you to death. Uh, the TV show um, allows me to actually utilize all my transferable skills. If I, like on a typical day, you've seen it before, I may interview, on one day I may interview 16 people. I may start off that morning at 9.30, interviewing up until one o'clock, we taping, you know, three weeks of, four weeks of shows. 
So when all those people walk into the door throughout the day for their interviews, all they need to know is about their little 10 minute interview. Right. They need to be an expert at what they do. I have to be an expert on that one day on all 16 topics. Right. If it wasn't that way, I wouldn't be stimulated. When I approach the interview, to close, when I approach the interview, I approach the interview like a full course meal. Right. Okay, and in that full course meal, the guest, in this case, I'm the guest. In that full course meal, the guest is the entree. Right. That's what they came to dinner to eat, the, the main entree. I am the plate that's holding up the entree. How about that? So I know that the viewers at home need to know about the guests, and I put myself in the background. Even though I have a, a, a big personality, a big image, if people watch me when I do interviews, I just basically answer questions and don't overbear, overstep the guests. I'm the plate. The guest is the entree. And my hope is that when the viewers see the interview, they will enjoy and be satisfied by that entree. That discreet plate that's holding them up will go in the dishwasher and come back and deliver another entree and go in the dishwasher again and deliver another entree. And that is the way that I can project people. In this particular case, my show, of course, has a wide range of people who appear on the show, all races and everything. Sure. But I purposely, on purpose, make sure that the majority of the people that appear on the show are of color. I say purposely because I could just go the opposite direction. If I just want all of my guests to be white, I can make all of my guests be white. I have a waiting list, a long waiting list of people to get on the show. I choose to do that because nobody else in this area, nobody has tried to do this on television in this area to show that kind of balance. So I find myself balancing everything and I love it. I love having my own color people on the show doing their thing. Sure. And the interesting thing is the people in the community think it's their show. Right. Even you, here you are hosting my show. This is no big deal. How, we see people hosting the show all the time. It got to the point where people just start sitting on the set, picking up the mic, and it's like, this our show, Lee, you get it. Right. I, when that started happening, I was like, first I was like, hmm. Then I realized that is exactly what I wanted it to be. Everybody's show. I call Esmond up. Esmond, come interview me. Boom, you come in. Now you a talk show host. Now you got to experience. If I need to be gone, there's Esmond ready to go. You see what I mean? I do. Isn't that the same man of the people that you spoke about from your high school days? Yeah, man. The, the same guy that they uh, elected as high school president because he was one of them, uh, to a degree, full circle. That's true. It's true. I just hate to kind of toot on that. I know you don't like talking but too check, much about but yourself. Check, check this out, though, Esmond. I'm, I'm going to go down that road because we got a few more minutes. This will be a two-part series. But uh, Lee Pitts Live After Work. Right. Lee Pitts Live After Work is the, uh, is, is the summary of all you just said. I've got this image, right? I got, I'm the front guy. Behind me is the team. I, if I'm the front guy for Lee Pitts Live After Work, which you are part of the team. We put together a social event Friday evening for primarily minority professionals come out to the club, Club Celsius, getting it in, and uh, for taking live entertainment, Food, photos, networking, just the whole gamut of thing. Interviews is just an unusual thing to see. It's just amazing. All of my friends who see me as a man of the people, I can get them on the phone and say, I need your help on this. Sure. Everybody knows that Lee's not going to try to squindle us. He's not going to be, this is going to be real. Y'all come together. We make it happen. It's always about we. It's always about being a plate holding up the entree, taking credit modestly, and all that other stuff takes care of itself. All the other accolades, all the other awards, all the other things that have come my way happen by osmosis. All right. I love that. <laughs> okay. I love that. Um, it has been my esteemed honor to be a part of this show. Uh, and, and I don't know, to be quite honest, I'm usually on the other side of, of this, uh, this desk. I, I, I like to do all of your traditions in terms of the uh, cup bumps. So. No, this is yours. This is you. Tell, plug your firm. 
My firm is a general civil litigation firm, and that, in plain English, that means civil lawsuits. So, um, garden variety things, law that people need is is where what what I try to do. Um, so, if you've got a contract matter, a landlord tenant matter, a uh, a real estate matter, um, a family law matter, um, we aim to please uh, with with the people. If you're elderly, or even if you're not elderly and you're looking to do a uh, power of attorney, a w last will and testament, you know, things that people actually need to, to navigate their way through life, that's what we do. Okay. My firm, you can reach me at 239-275-2215, and online, our website is www.ejlaw.com, so ejlaw.com. There you go, people. And uh, I'll have uh, the, do you have a quote? Now, now I've got to get you to close the show out. Do you have a quote, whether it's by Dr. King or somebody, just a little small quote that you want to leave people with, they eat that up. From my work, I, I go by a quote from uh, the book of Micah, and it's, let justice roll down like waters. And it was uh, made famous by Dr. King, and it's something that I try to live my life, my professional life by, um, uh, when I take up some, someone's case or someone's matter, uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to get justice for, for people. It may seem simple, but at the end of the day, it's about getting people what they want and what they need uh, and deserve from a, a certain legal situation. And, and with that in mind, we, we go all over. We, we try to do the best that we can for the people. It, it, well, you can probably attest to that fact. When somebody entrusts their business to yes. you, even if it's just, hey, Lee, interview me about my thing, my program, my service, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that everybody feels like a big deal when they come through your doors, uh, just like I feel like a big deal television host now that I'm interviewing <laughs> you. It's so cool, man. I get such a pleasure uh, to wrap this up. I get such a pleasure out of seeing other people grow when you can be a person who gets pleasure out of seeing other people's other people grow, no more than when I was running a point guard and I would pass it off and then get the nice assist and the guy who got the dunk or whatever he run back up the, I'd just be happy that he's happy, but uh, he wouldn't have gotten that basket without my nice little look away Magic Johnson assist. I, I will say this, as I know you you shouted out your wife Michelle, who is a beautiful woman, inside and out people. And, uh, and I will say, as to my wife, Paris, I, I'd like to also shout her out. Um, one of the, well, the most gorgeous woman on this planet, to me. And, and her inside is as beautiful as her outside. Um, but, you know, what is it like to have a beautiful wife who's there behind you 100%? I know you can, you know, attest to what that feels like. I certainly love that about uh, my relationship, and certainly my kids as well. Um, uh, you, you know, you have a son, I've got four daughters. And, and uh, one of your daughters, by the way, who's doing well in dancing, I'm letting her know this on TV right now, she's got to get on the TV show before she blows up too big and then she won't come on Leap It's Live. So can I uh, say I know somebody who knows somebody who can get her on the show? Absolutely. <laughs> well, you, you certainly do. I've got four, four daughters, uh, Makesha, Miana, Annalise, mm -hmm. and Ava. And you were talking about my daughter, Annalise, who mm. is a, an excellent dancer. I, I tell you, Lee, every time she dances, she brings tears to my eyes. I've never seen something more beautiful on, on a dance stage. She doesn't do it a lot. To be quite honest, that dance that you're referring to that you saw, that was my Father's Day present. Because, you know, these girls, they're thinking about well, I buying I thought she gifts. was in some art school and she was ballet or something. I mean. Well, she did. She, she dances for uh, Robin Dawn okay. Dance uh, Academy. And they right. travel and, and mm -hmm. do that. We've been doing that for years. As, as she started high school, she's now going into her junior year. As she started high school, she sort of um, has taken a break to run track. So she's, mm. she's always been an athlete. athlete from gymnastics to dance gotcha. to now track. Um, but she still has that gift. And hitting the books. And, 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 and a straight A student. That, that, usually when they do a lot of sports like that, they do well in the books. It, it keeps you, keeps mm -hmm. you grounded, disciplined. And, okay. and I love that about all, all of the girls. So. so now you need to look in that camera and say, we'll see you next week on Lee Pitts Live. We'll see you next week <laughs> on Lee Pitts Live.